Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
find me with the broken and the weak in the spaces in between. You'll hear my voice cry out with those who weep only if you're listening. There are many ways we collaborate with each other to be the church we're called to be and to serve how we serve. And our contributing financially is one of the most important of those ways. If you want to help fund and sustain what we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org contribute to see the many simple ways that you can do so. You can even text CrosspointNC to 77977 to receive a link to get started now. Thank you for your partnership in the work we do together.
Today I'm going to talk about one thing, but I'm actually talking about another thing, all kinds of other things actually. And I want to say right here at the start that if, I, if I'm not careful, and I intend to be, I, I may very well reduce the lived experience of many of my very dear siblings, uh, reduce their lives to a point that I'm making, you know, or a, 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 an illustration and a church talk. I sincerely hope to avoid that um, because uh, you deserve better than to become, you know, an exhibit under lights for the rest of us to consider. So I sincerely hope um, to honor people um, even as I talk about them. Um, it's not much of a disclaimer, but it is one. And the first part of this might sound a little bit like a point uh, others have already been making in recent years, and I, I totally acknowledge that, um, but I want to take that point just a bit further if I'm able to today. So Jesus, talking to his disciples right before his arrest, he said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you're cursed. Depart from me into the fire of the ages, prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's a lot to think about in that passage. And I want you to know, I, I skimmed it. There's some big chunks I took out because I, I wanted to focus on the imagery. Please go read that from, from Matthew uh, 25. Um, it's worth it. It talks about justice and it's, it's profound. I'm admitting that I skimmed it because I wanted to focus on the particular imagery Jesus uses to make his point about justice and love. So let's, let's think about this imagery. You've got sheep and you've got goats, which obviously sheep have no inherent goodness and, and goats don't have any inherent badness in an agricultural setting that you know Jesus was largely speaking to. The imagery made sense and would have been striking. But even more central, is the sides the sheep and the goats go on. Like, which side does one not want to end up on in this picture? The left-hand side. Jesus, we're told over and over, he says it in the Gospels, uh, it says it about him in Acts, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus sits at the right hand of God. To sit at the right hand of the king or of a God, that, that's a way of saying that you share in that king's power. This is where the queen sits, to the right of the sovereign. This is where the eldest son sits, the, the heir apparent. This imagery is about the seat of shared power and strength and sameness of name found at the right hand. No one wants to end up on the left side of the king or of a God, because that's the, the hand of judgment. That's the hand of unwanted consequences. All the way back in Genesis 48 tells the story of Jacob deliberately crossing his hands to place his right hand on the head of the child he wanted to bless and his left hand on the child he didn't intend to bless. And it, it causes a, a whole thing. You should read the story. It's fascinating. But the right hand held the blessing and everybody knew that. It didn't have to be explained in the story. Exodus chapter 15 captures a song that Moses sang, and it has the lyric, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. And, and then generations later, another song in Psalm 118 would put it, There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. Hundreds of years after that, the way of talking about the right and the left hands hadn't changed one bit. Nobody questioned it. Paul said in the New Testament letter at Galatians, uh, when he was described, uh, describing being accepted by early church leaders, uh, he said, when, when James and Peter and John, who were acknowledged pillars of the church, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas, Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship the right hand of fellowship. We still do that. Why not the left hand? 
I mean, no one, no one would have asked that, but I'm asking now. Why not the left? What's the left hand of fellowship? Well, there's no such thing. Why is the left hand never spoken of positively? In fact, it's spoken of negatively. Well, simply because people have thought for probably most of human history that the left hand is bad. It's dishonorable and it's used for dishonorable things, unclean, gross, non-hygienic things. The, the left hand, uh, it, it's even considered evil. It's associated with deceit, with violence, behaviors that others find immoral or unfavorable. The word sinister in Latin uh, is a, it's, it's a Latin word. It, it means on the left. And so sinister came to be used for describing malevolence or immorality. Interestingly, the right hand in Latin is dexter. And that's where we get our word dexterity. Uh, I'll let you decide if the name dexter still means the opposite of sinister in our popular consciousness these days. Uh, even in English, left comes from an Anglo-Saxon word, lift, which means weak, weakness. In dozens, maybe hundreds, at least dozens of languages today, including English, right, as in the right side, has been adopted as a word meaning right, correct, true, just, while left is the majority of the time, that's a derisive, condemning term. In many places throughout the world to this day, you would never shake hands with the left. Like, what are you thinking? You would never give directions and point with your left hand. How disrespectful that is. Now, add to the fact that the left is thought to be dishonorable and bad and evil. Being left-handed has also long thought to be not what God intended. Judges chapter 3 describes Ehud, son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a left-handed man. But that's an English translation. The actual literal Hebrew says Ehud, son of Gera, a Benjaminite, an impeded right-hand man. Because in the old world, you weren't left-handed. You had a deficient right hand and were stuck using the only hand that you had left. What a bummer. So I don't want to understate this. The default, the natural, God intended dominant hand according to the, the majority ancient opinion and reinforced throughout the scriptures is the right hand. The left is for evil, for dishonor, for shame. Being left hand dominant is not what God intended according to the ancient thinking. For most of Christian history, if you, if you heard someone say, left-handedness is perfectly natural. It isn't evil. God made some people right-handed and some people left-handed and some people even both-handed. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Mind your own business about what hand people use. For thousands of years, you could expect somebody to respond to that with, uh, read your Bible. The Bible clearly says you are rejecting God's word. You are spreading falsehoods. You're a liar. You are, you are disrespecting the Bible. You're disrespecting God. You are misinterpreting the Bible because of what you want it to say, not what it actually says. Read your Bible and stop lying. And you know what? People saying these things, they, they would have had Bible verses. They would have had church support. Other people standing by listening, that they, they would have said, yeah, read your Bible. It's obvious. The Bible clearly says it, and it's obviously unnatural. Like, what are you trying to shove down our throats right now with this left-hand garbage? Now, at this point, I'm sure you can realize that I'm, I'm talking about left-handedness as a metaphor or an allegory, and other people have done that too. And, and so we'll get to that. But at the same time, I'm not doing that. I'm literally talking about left-handedness because it quite literally is frowned on in the Bible and the culture that brought us the, the different texts that we came to call the Bible. But now it occupies almost none of our thinking. There, there is a literal bias against left-handedness em embodied in our language and the morals and assumptions and values of cultures throughout history and around the world, but it's not like that now. It changed. Quite literally, there have been countless sermons in the history of the church that didn't speak of left-handedness symbolically, but 
also precisely, like literally left-handedness as evil, as an extension of sinful, deficient ways of being a person, left-handedness was something that you, you had to heal. You had to fix it. You had to hide it if you couldn't save it, literally. And so I want us to feel that right now, to feel how absurd that is now, how warped and backward and silly and outdated that kind of negative energy being leveled at people is for, for something as common as blue eyes, literally as common as blue eyes, to, to, to sit with how we've dismissed it now as it's just old ideas. And as I'm calling it absurd, some of you lefties are old enough to remember that, you know, it, it wasn't as non-taboo uh, just, you know, a couple of decades ago as, as it is now. Uh, you, you remember being forced to use your right hand at an early age, even though you were left-handed. It's like conversion therapy is what it was. And it causes tons of problems for children, which is now very well documented scientifically. Forcing a left-handed child to be right-hand dominant uh, when they're not right-hand dominant, it, it causes speech and learning disorders, dyslexia and stuttering, and of course, shame. Then there's the other stuff for lefties growing up in a right-handed world that, you know, us right-handers, we never had to think about it. The pencil sharpener on the wall in school, that was tricky for you lefties, wasn't it? And the way the, the, the desk that was attached to the chair went, you know, for us right-handers, it was easy. We could put our elbow down while we wrote, and your arm had to float out there because there was nowhere to rest your, rest your arm. That must have made it difficult. And then scissors. Man, scissors. What a hassle scissors must have been. And then you grow up and everything from, from golf clubs to stick shifts to other people's drum sets. Um, it's all just a little bit more effort for, for you than the other 90 or so percent of us. I, and I just read this week of a study at Durham University that said um, left-handed men were almost twice as likely to die in war because weapons and, uh, and equipment are generally made for right-handed people. Um, I don't know any left-handed people, by the way, who want pity for their dominant hand. I, I, I'm in no, I, in no way am I I'm trying to rally uninvited sympathy for something that's not actually a deficiency. That's not my motivation at all. I'm just trying to show how there's this minority of people that have a trait that it used to be a taboo. It used to be awful. And now it's not. Now it's probably inconvenient in many ways, a burden that uh, to adapt to, to a world that's generally geared for the rest of us far better. What I'm doing is I'm trying to highlight that the way that we think about this has almost completely shifted in the last handful of decades. And that most of us, we don't think about it at all now. Even those of us who've memorized the Bible, we just don't have any feelings about this, no judgments about this at all. None of us feel like full accept acceptance of left-handed people brought on the destruction of civilization. Now, I know this isn't necessary, but in order to remove any remaining doubt, we wanted to offer this amendment here at Crosspoint. If you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you're joyful and have come to celebrate, if you're left-handed and smear all of your writing, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Dang it. That was Cece Claybrook, who is left-handed. And she told me that her father told her when she was a little girl that everybody is born left-handed, but you become right-handed when you sin. So I think it's something us right-handers should think about if we're ever feeling cocky. Okay. You may have seen this simple chart in the last couple years. It comes from a credibly conducted survey some years back about human handedness, and it shows the rate of left, -hand left handedness in people as co and connected to what year they were born. So when you look at it, it looks like someone put something in the water like a few decades back and made a whole bunch of people left handed all of a sudden. But what we're actually seeing is people being born into an era where forcing kids to convert or forcing kids to hide their left-hand dominance, it was going away, it was phasing out. Science was showing that it, it caused harm 
to, to change the way that a, a, a kid wrote or, or used uh, their hands for playing or for, for using tools or whatever. It, it was actually harmful to who, the, who they were and that there was nothing inherently bad about which hand you used in, in the first place. Science was changing things. Society was beginning to realize all, all that talk of sinister or clumsy or deficiency it was much ado about nothing. So in this graph, we're not seeing an increase in left-handedness in the early 1900s. We're seeing a decrease in stigma, which unveils and frees the actual truth. But imagine what one might say in a world where all these kids are saying they're left-handed suddenly. You could willfully misunderstand what you're seeing and say, well, look at the new fad the kids are into now. Boy, it wasn't like that when I was a kid. What is happening to the world? The latest thing now seems to be kids suddenly saying, oh, I'm left-handed. I'm so special. Notice me. This, this trend, this fad. And then left-handed scissors in my child's classroom? Let's boycott big scissor for jamming the left-hand agenda down our traditionally right-handed throats. Let me shift clumsily here to a more, to more pressing questions this Pride Month. Is the increase in the number of visible trans people, trans youth, a fad? Can we reduce it to a trend or to some agenda? Is, is that what's happening? Are there suddenly more gay kids than there were in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s? Have tons more people suddenly decided to be gay because it's in fashion? Or has decreased stigma, a gradual increase in support and inclusion and even defense, and the ongoing illumination of science, have those things simply unveiled, uncovered, freed what's actually been true underneath? That people are trans, and they always have been. That people are gay, and they always have been. How many people? Who knows? We, we probably don't know where we are on the graph just yet. Time will tell. How many people will it take for some of us to understand it's, it's perfectly normal and natural? Like how many more people would we need to see before we realize it's, it's completely normal? Like blue eyes, like left-hand dominance. Uh, I don't know. How long will it be before people realize that the culture war they're fighting against our LGBTQ siblings, a war fought in the trenches of church denominations or Target or Bud Light or wherever, a war someone else declared for them, by the way. We, we don't read the Bible and determine on our own, okay, obviously other people's gender and sex lives is what Jesus' faith is all balanced on. Someone else decided and assigned all that, speaking of agendas. How long before they realize these are people. These are people, not issues, not agendas. These are people trying to live their lives equally without others' disdain or bigotry or, or hate or unjust policies aimed at them. These are people. These are our siblings, fellow creations of God. How long will it take for people to understand that my faith in Jesus doesn't require me to be part of culture wars against them any more than I am required to go backward to reignite the culture war over which hand you use to sign your name? How long will it be? I, I don't know. Time will tell. I hope it's soon. And let me say, I do understand that when it comes to shifting our thinking on things like this, it's hard. It's been hard for all the other issues too. It's hard because you're not just changing your mind. It feels like you're losing things that you weren't supposed to lose. It feels like you're, you're parting with parts of your tradition, that you're moving into this risky territory of, of where you used to feel more secure and, and certain. It feels like you're, you're parting ways with maybe even your family and friends. I know that that's what comes with it. I really appreciate that fact. And I hope that you will appreciate that fact when you're dealing with other people who are trying to expand their beliefs and their understanding beyond the tolerances of their own context. But realizing we're talking about people, not issues, that's what shifts us. That's what changes us because that's what love does. 
And then another thing that changed for me was reading history, church history, even recent church history, and finding how often influential thinkers would say the Bible is clear and nature and what's normal makes it totally obvious. How, how often they would say the Bible is perfectly clear plus common sense, just look around. How often people have been wrong about that. I mean, left-handedness is just the, it's the tip of the iceberg. For a long, long time, bigotry has been sustained by the claim that the Bible is clear, and then that sentiment is connected to this, some too narrow understanding of what is natural, what's possible, what's, what's normal or not. So you'll have people saying, the Bible clearly says, and plus look around, as sort of a one-two punch about what is allowed to happen, what's supposed to be. But when we talk about what is natural as a way of trying to shut down the lived experience of LGBTQ people, we have to recognize that this is a convenient way of sounding like we're talking in absolutes about what can happen, what, what can exist, and what can't. But really what we're doing is saying, uh, when we're saying natural, is we're saying that this represents what I'm comfortable accepting about real life. And we all do this. Some of us say natural, some of us say normal, but it's the same idea. So maybe it's helpful to consider, did you know Paul said it was unnatural, abnormal, for a man to have long hair? In 1 Corinthians, he said it. He says, doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's dishonoring to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. He thought it was obvious. This same Paul knew about Samson in the Bible, who lived a millennia before him, right? The Bible hero who's famous for his long hair and how it made him strong, how it was a good thing that he had long hair. And what would Paul say to all the Bible-believing churches and seminaries with an image of this long-haired hippie hanging in their hallways? Is, is short hair natural or is long hair natural? What's the natural length of hair? Why is it so easy for us to dismiss all this, all, Paul's view on long hair and what he thought was natural about long, about long hair, but then hold up his other culturally specific views on other things as though those are inflexible laws for all time, universally? See, natural for Paul probably doesn't mean what naturally occurs as much as it means what my present culture has generally agreed on. The long hair, what long hair and short hair means on men and women. Not for all time, but for right now, should be pretty obvious. We have those now. What the Bible says and what seems to be natural or normal it is an evolving conversation and not as final as, as many of us learned it was supposed to be. And we know this. If we could admit that we know this, we know we can't appeal to nature. Uh, to, to what is quote unquote normal with our understanding now of biology and psychology and different cultures we, to appeal to, to what's normal or natural and think that we're going to find support for a specific traditional view about sexuality or gender. Honestly, we know that that doesn't work at all. And it becomes easy to admit that we know it doesn't work when we look backward and observe how it's gone for other people on various other topics. I mean, there's the left-handed thing, but think about the other ways in which people of faith have denied reality in the name of God and denied what, what was allowed to be based on what they said was normal or natural or obvious. Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, the reason we're all gathered in this context and not you know, in some other Catholic or Orthodox context, Martin Luther had thoughts about Copernicus. Maybe you've heard of Copernicus. Uh, back in 1539, Martin Luther said, there was mention of a certain new astrologer who wanted to prove that the earth moves, not the sky, the sun, and the moon. This would be as if somebody were riding on a cart or in a ship and imagined he was standing still while the earth and the trees were moving. So it goes now, whoever wants to be clever must agree with nothing that others esteem. He must do something of his own. This is what that fellow, and the, the German might be translated, this is what that fool, as in Copernicus, this is what he does, who wishes to turn the whole of established astronomy upside down. You can almost hear him saying, give me a break. 
even in these things that are thrown into disorder. I believe the Holy Scriptures, for Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. You see how he argues about nature? What we can obviously see. You're, that's like saying the cart's holding still and the earth is moving. And then what's obvious in the scriptures? See how dismissive you can be with your Bible verses and your common sense? But here we are now, our kindergartners know something Martin Luther didn't know, wouldn't, wouldn't accept. Because we amended our understanding of both the Bible and our, what we observe in nature in light of what's actual. And we are better for it. In 1982, the president of Bob Jones University in South Carolina, Bob Jones the, the III, he was defending the school policy that banned interracial marriage and dating. This is how he said it. The Bible clearly teaches, starting in the 10th chapter of Genesis and going all the way through, that God has put differences among people on the earth to keep the earth divided. See, the Bible is clear, plus look around at what's naturally occurring around us. This is how it's supposed to be. He was wrong and wrong. The policy was finally changed in 2000, which is embarrassingly recent, and we're better for it. We're better for it. In 1960, when his grandfather said, wherever we have the races mixed up in large numbers, we have trouble. These religious liberals are the worst infidels in many ways in the country, and some of them are filling pulpits down south. I think he was talking about me. They do not believe the Bible any longer, so it does not do any good to quote it to them. They have gone over to modernism, and they are leading the white people astray at the same time, and they are leading colored Christians astray. But every good, substantial, Bible-believing, intelligent, orthodox Christian can read what the Word of God and, uh, and know that what is happening in the South now is not of God. What is happening? Look around. What should be? It's, it's obvious. It's common sense. Plus, the Bible is clear, and if you really believed it, you'd see it. He was wrong and wrong. We amended ourselves, and we're better for it. In 1823, the Reverend Richard Furman, the first president of the South Carolina State Baptist Convention, said to a non-objecting crowd, the right of holding slaves is clearly established by the Holy Scriptures, both by precept and example. The Bible's clear. And look at the nature of things all around us. It's obvious. Wrong and wrong. We amended our understanding, and we're better for it. In 1846, the Reverend Leonard Bacon wrote in defense of American slavery, which we should note Christian ministers wrote nearly half of the defenses of slavery back then and generally used scripture to do it. Uh, Bacon said, the evidence that there were both slaves and masters of slaves in churches founded and directed by the apostles cannot be got rid of without resorting to methods of interpretation that will get rid of everything. See, the Bible clearly taught it. Get rid of that. The whole faith is going to come apart. Look around. What we're doing is natural, has precedent. It's obvious. It was wrong and wrong. Evil defended as good, and we amended our understanding, and we're better for it. Still have work to do, but we're better for it. 1869, a notable Baptist minister named Justin Dewey Fulton offered this gem in his screed against a woman's right to vote. He said, the Bible is the revealed will of God, and it declares the God-given sphere of woman. The Bible is, then, our authority for saying woman must content herself with this sphere. Who demands the ballot for a woman? They're not lovers of God. <laughs> who, who wants women to have the right to vote, not people who love God, nor are they believers in Christ as a class. There may be exceptions, but the majority prefer an infidel's cheer to the favor of God and the love of Christian community. The Bible is clear. I mean, it clearly says if you loved God, you'd see it's right there. Just read it. Plus, look at nature. Look around. The natural sphere of women doesn't include things like this. And they, they should be happy with the, the sphere that we gave them. Excuse me, that God gave them. Wrong and wrong, we amended our understanding and we're better for it. You see how history moves? See how it's moving? See how the Spirit walks us kicking and screaming into a future of more equality and more acceptance, but at the expense of the clarity we thought that we had? See how... See how we, we are brought forward, and then we're soon able to look backward and, and say, what were we thinking? That's ridiculous. That was evil. That's absurd. See, and how every generation thinks it's immune from the errors of the previous generations. And how 
it's always those not in the majority who end up having to pay. How long before we recognize, despite our current confidence about what the Bible supposedly states so clearly and what nature makes so plain, just look around, it's obvious, use common sense. How long before many of us recognize that, what, that we're about to be locked in on the wrong side of history yet again on the new issue, on the inclusion, the acceptance, the equality of LGBTQ people in our lives. We're about to be laughably locked in to the wrong side of history. Again, how many of us are going to be quoted in sermons in a hundred years that will use us as an illustration about what an old fashioned commit commitment to rejecting reality looked like back in 2023, those poor fools. How long before we finally get that the marginalization of certain others because we think that's what holiness and morality for us means. How, how long before we realize that's the exact thing Jesus fought, taught, and lived against? How long before we see that we tend to be more prone to drawing lines than staying in step with a spirit who's always inviting us into more inclusion, more love, more awareness and understanding, more embrace of the other? I hope it's soon. I hope we start seeing very soon how much work there is to do in shaking off old ways of thinking and being because we're all going to be better for it. Everything will get better as we move in step with the Spirit. A commitment to refusing to change our minds feels like strong faith, like we're up, upholding our end of the deal even as the currents are, are shifting. It feels like strong faith. I know that, but it's not. Refusing to change your mind is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's fear. That's what fear does. And we can see this so plainly in hindsight, can't we? What a miracle it would be to be able to see it happening right now. To see it and then begin working and living where the Spirit is working and living. Each of us becoming more accepting, more loving, more affirming people to other people because that's what we see in Jesus. The Spirit is inviting us into spaces that, yes, it's going to cause friction. When love moves into fearful spaces, friction happens initially. Absolutely. But the Spirit is inviting us and leading us into those spaces all the same in every facet of our lives, in our, the, the way that we treat people just out in public or at work or at school, and the, and the way that we get involved uh, publicly as a community and in, in politics, the Spirit is inviting us into those spaces because more justice and love and equality and unity is where this has always been headed. It's where Jesus has always been taking it. And my sincere hope is that we will give ourselves to getting it right or, or left. My sincere hope is that we will give ourselves to getting it aligned with love. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home 